So um, I want to talk, I just first want to lay the groundwork and talk about the difference between weight loss and fat loss. So if most of you are working with the general population, the vast majority of people that come to you are probably interested in weight loss. Would you say that's true? And people will say, oh, I just want to get healthy. I'm not really interested in losing weight. That's, that's crap. They, they want to lose weight. They say they want to get healthy. They say this and that. But the truth is people want to, want to lose weight, whether it be for aesthetics, 90% of the time it's for aesthetics. Um, sometimes people have a scare that drives them into doing that, but people tend to be way, way focused on weight and not focused on body composition, right? And how many times have you worked with somebody who loses five pounds and they say, oh, this program didn't work because I only lost five pounds? Well, losing five pounds, you could lose five pounds and not look any different. You lose five pounds of pure fat and you're gonna look different. There's a big difference between five pounds of fat weight and five pounds of weight. So what we focus on is, you know, we have a weight management lab, but what we really focus on is changing body composition. And I started thinking to myself, you know, if we look at, at weight loss uh, prescription and things like that, uh, ACSM, CDC, all these things focus on, on straight up weight loss, and there's not really a whole lot of concentration on body comp. And people say, well, you know, what do, we, what do we typically do? What's the typical thing that we, we do when we want to lose weight? We typically calorie, calorie restrict and we do a bunch of cardio, right? And, and, and we just want to get lighter. And um, we'll look a little bit about the, at the prescriptions for weight loss, and that's pretty much what it boils down to. So I just want to make the distinction again between fat loss and weight loss. So here we have two people. This is Paula Radcliffe. She's an elite marathoner. And this is Nicole Wilkins, who you might recognize. She's a, a competitive uh, figure uh, competitor. So if you look at these two people, um, these two people can, can be at the same. They look like they're roughly at the same percent body fat. But the one on the right, this person obviously has more muscle than the person on the left. So the question is, is there an advantage to that? So, um, maybe they're both around, they look like just eyeballing it, they're probably around 12% fat, something like that. But if this one has more muscle than this person, is there some metabolic advantage to that, right? And that's kind of what we're, we're trying to get at here. Um, it seems to me that if you look at who the most lean populations are, you look at somebody like a bodybuilder, for example. A professional bodybuilder is really, really lean, right? Low body fat percentage. And that's kind of what we're striving for, but not really to that degree. So why then are weight loss strategies focused mainly on cardio instead of building muscle, right? So this sort of has always bothered me. So in our lab, we really focus on um, increasing muscle mass as opposed to um, giving people a bunch of cardio. So if we look at ACSM guidelines to prevent weight gain, to prevent weight gain, this is not to lose weight, this is to prevent weight gain. 150 to 250 minutes, which roughly equates to two and a half to four hours per week of moderate intensity physical activity, and this is cardio, okay? So you know, if you tell most people where most people start doing two and a half hours of exercise per week, and you tell them that you're not gonna lose weight, this is just to prevent weight gain, they're not gonna be really happy about that, right? That's a lot of exercise to have nothing happen as a result of that. For weight loss, these are the guidelines, greater than 250 minutes needed to provide clinically significant, which is 5% or greater of a change in body weight. So that's pretty discouraging you know, in my mind, when you tell somebody that this is the amount of exercise that they're gonna have to do. If you look at the CDC guidelines, to maintain your weight, to maintain, it's basically the same thing, work your way up to 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity activity. And to lose weight and keep it off, this is a brilliant, I love this, not to rip on the CDC, but I'm gonna rip on the CDC. Um, to lose weight and keep it off, you will need a high amount of physical activity unless you also adjust your diet and reduce the amount of calories you're eating and drinking. Getting to and staying at a healthy weight requires both regular physical activity and a healthy eating plan, which essentially tells you nothing, right? It's saying you have to exercise more and you have to eat at some appropriate level that we're not gonna define. We're just gonna expect that the American public is gonna somehow go out there and figure out, okay, this is what I'm gonna to eat to put me at an appropriate calorie level and I'm gonna do a high amount of physical activity and that's gonna make me lose weight. 
it's no wonder that people fail, right? It's no wonder that 70% of the population is overweight because these prescriptions, you know, they don't make any sense to the average person. And even to people who know what they're doing, you're probably not gonna get people to do them anyway, okay? So something has to change, right? And if you look at the way the physical activity guidelines are sort of calculated is, you know, you look at, at how sedentary society has become, and then you say, okay, well now you have to exercise even this much more to be able to make up for that increase in sedentary time. And people aren't willing to do it, okay. So typically what happens, or this commonly happens, is let's say we have weight, body weight on the Y and time on the X, and people are slowly gaining weight, right? Every year you're putting on like two or three pounds of fat. And you get to this point where you say, you know what, I'm sick of being at this weight, I'm gonna take up an exercise program and I'm gonna lose weight. So let's say I follow this strategy where I do three hours of cardio per week. And that three hours is enough to prevent weight gain, right? It's enough to prevent me from gaining any more weight. So let's say when I make this decision that I'm gonna start exercising, let's say I'm 180 pounds. And I take up this three week, these three hours of cardio per week. I do that for six weeks and that increase in activity is just enough to offset the surplus of calories that I'm eating. So my weight doesn't change, it stays the same. I, I prevented the rate of gain. But what do I do if I'm somebody who takes up three hours of cardio for six weeks and now I get on the scale six weeks later and I weigh exactly the same as I did when I started? What am I gonna do? I'm gonna quit, right? I'm gonna say this doesn't work, I'm gonna quit there and then what's gonna happen? Your weight's gonna start going right back up. So people don't see a prevention in weight gain as a success, right? It, did it work? Sure it worked. You know, you, you've prevented yourself from putting on any more fat, but it wasn't enough to make you lose. And as a result of that, you're gonna quit, okay? And we see it all the time. So why don't we typically recommend, or why, doesn't, why don't these organizations typically recommend strength training for, for fat loss? Well, if you look at the research, if you look at most of the research looking at aerobic training versus resistance training, aerobic training is more effective on paper, okay? But why is that? A lot of these things are flawed program design, resistance training wise, the resistance training programs are just flawed. It's no surprise that they don't in, uh, result in fat loss. There's a focus on body weight instead of body composition. If you're just looking at, does this, does this program make the person lighter? Of course cardio is gonna, gonna help get a person lighter because the person who's lifting weights is probably gonna put on muscle mass and they're gonna get heavier, right? Diet's not monitor controlled. If I give somebody a, a resistance training program but pay no attention to their diet and say don't increase or don't worry about increasing protein or don't worry about what they're eating to begin with, how do I know that training program is gonna be effective? I don't, right? These things have to be in place to get a good idea. Protein needs not met, study duration is too short, um, there's a low calorie burn for weight training compared to aerobic activity and the general approach is, well, aerobic activity burns more calories while I'm doing it and weight loss is really about creating a calorie deficit. If cardio burns more calories than resistance training, then ergo I should do cardio, and that's, and that's basically how the approach has gone. So what's the rationale behind strength training? And I sort of believe that, that a more, I guess more sustainable and more effective approach to weight loss and fat loss is not really looking at how many calories you burn during the exercise itself, but rather, can you increase the resting metabolic rate? So if you, can, if you can take somebody and give them a program that causes their 24-hour calorie burn to go up, that seems to me like something that's much more sustainable than essentially directly exercising away that ca calorie surplus, right? I'll sort of try and explain that here in a second. So let's say we have somebody who comes into our lab and they're at an RMR of about 1,500. So just sitting in a chair, doing nothing, they're burning 1,500 calories in a 24-hour period. If I give that person, and let's say this is a, they come in on day one, if I give that person a full body resistance training workout, full body, basic, heavy basic exercises, everything to failure, that elevates the resting metabolic rate for some given period of time. And st some studies show that can be 36, uh, 36 hours, even longer in some cases, depending on the amount of training volume. If I elevate that RMR, it stays elevated for, I don't know, maybe 36, 48 hours, then it comes back down. We give them another workout, we elevate the RMR again. 
we give them another workout, we elevate the RMR again. Essentially what you've done is, and if you can increase that RMR by 20%, now this person is now burning 1,800 calories instead of 1,500 at rest. And that can be done, right? We, d we do it. So this can be done. So if you think about this, you know, if somebody's RMR is now 1,800 instead of 1,500, they're burning an extra 300 calories a day, right, by only working out three times. Okay, that is significant. That adds up over time, right? Now if the person wants to do cardio, let them do two cardio on the off days to just burn some extra calories. So this is the general approach we take with our clients, okay, is use resistance training as the primary mode of exercise and cardio as a secondary form of exercise. Does it necessarily result in as much fat loss as cardio? In the short term, probably not. But what it does do is allow for elevation of the RMR. So if you're willing to get people to, you sort of have to explain to people that this isn't an overnight process, but if you're willing to commit to this, in the long run, this is gonna end up helping, I think, more than, than doing a bunch of cardio. Well, and I'll, I'll show you more about that here in a second. So this would be like an example workout that we would give, and the, and the population that we work at work with is mainly middle-aged women, right? 35 to, to 50, somewhere in there, 30 to 50, um, and pretty much that's it. That's, that's who mainly comes to us. Now we also work with athletes and competitors and things like that, but I wanted to show the general population what we do with them, because a lot of people say, we, you'll never gonna get women to do this, and that, that's not true. They will do it, okay? So this would be a typical workout, um, big muscle exercises, um, four sets to failure, typical high volume type stuff. And again, people say, oh, they're never gonna do this. Um, people do it when they, when they actually see what happens. And that's the important thing. They have to get results, right? If you take somebody who's never resistance trained, if you take a, like a 40-year-old a female who's never strength trained and you put that person in the gym and give them this workout, you know how fast their strength goes up? It may not be that they have um, physiological changes at the muscle yet, but within a week, the people are lifting a lot more weight than they ever thought they could and they say, I can't believe I'm actually doing this. And that's very motivating when people stick to it. So, what we do, and we have lots of remote clients from across the country that we work with, we put their workouts on a Google Drive and share this drive with them. So here's this person's workout. This is day one, day two, day three, and you can see they go in there and they actually put in the weight and the reps that they, that they did. This formula just calculates volume, and I just made the spreadsheet one day, and um, volume ultimately for the week gets calculated here, and I just look at this volume so we can look at it together, and when that volume stops going up or when it plateaus, we give them a new workout, right? So you can see that it's, it, it allows for people to actually document their changes, and they can look at this and say, well, this is what I did last week, or this is how many reps I got last week. I want to beat this this week, and that's the goal. And you can see this person's actually logged in here. This is one of our clients, and she was in there at the same time I was printing the thing out. So. Um, that accountability is really important because they think, oh, Todd's looking at my workout sheet. I got it. No, I don't know. I don't think they go in there and just fill stuff in randomly, but people either do it or they don't. But um, a lot of people, more than you would think, will actually stick to this and follow it just because this is here. So I want to talk about the eating program that we use. We call this metabolism-based eating just because we didn't really have any name for it. And um, last year, uh, we were do, doing a, a Dr. Oz episode in our lab because we were doing some metabolism testing for somebody else, and they said, what do you call this, what you do here? And I said, uh, metabolism-based eating. You know, just made it up. So they're like, okay, we'll call it that. So this is the, this is the way we come up with the diet program um, because it's based on the metabolism. So things that we typically hear from people who come into the lab, and this, this is things they hear from doctors, dietitians, trainers, um, the number one thing, cut carbs. Doc, I've had, I've had doc, people come in and say, my doctor told me, just stop eating carbs and you'll lose weight, that's it. We hear that, we hear that all the time. Eat more heart healthy fats. You've all heard this, right? Fat has calories in it, okay, <laughs> right? Just keep that in mind. We have more people that come to us that tell us they're eating avocados, almonds, coconut oil, 
right? And, and, they're, and they cut out carbs, and they wonder why they can't lose weight, right? Because they're not monitoring how much of they're eating it, they're just eating it, right? We had this guy come in the lab one day, and he's walking us through his day, and he's like, yeah, this is what I eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, and it all sounds really good. And, you know, the dietitian, and we're sitting there, and like, all right, you know, this isn't ad enough. This guy's not losing weight. Um, I don't know what percent fat he was. And we're like, what do you eat at night when you're sitting in front of the TV? He says, almonds. All right, how many almonds do you eat? He goes, about 200. Okay? So, so I go home, and I count out 200 almonds, right? And I count out 200 almonds, and I measure 200, 1,500 calories, right? So if that guy's eating 1,500, now, are almonds heart healthy? Yeah, heart healthy fat, right? Not if you eat 1,500 of them, right? <laughs> if, if food isn't healthy or unhealthy, food is nutritious or non-nutritious, right? Almonds are nutritious. If you eat 1,500 of them, you're going to become obese. That's not healthy, right? The almonds are the thing that's making you obese, okay? If he ate... If he went home and ate 200 calories worth of Twinkies every night, he wouldn't be obese, right? Compared to eating 1,500 calories worth of almonds. And people don't make that distinction. They say, well, salmon's good for me. Is salmon good for Yeah, it's good for you. It's got a lot of omega-3s and heart-healthy fats. But you can't eat a ton of it, and you can't cook it in coconut oil and crust it with almonds three times a day. We had a woman come in and tells me she eats three avocados a day, 750 calories. You're not going to undo that, right? All right. Don't eat processed foods. Cut out all sugar. Eat organic. Get all your calories from real food. So what's the problem with this? The problem with this is you could do all of these things, and this does not guarantee you that you're not going to be over fat, right? You could do every one of these things, and it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you're over fat, right? Because if you're in a calorie surplus, doing all these things, you're going to get fat. It's that simple. All right. So what do we do? First thing somebody comes in, we measure their metabolic rate. We don't use online predictions. We don't use the Harris-Benedict equation or anything like that. If you do that, it's going to be wrong. Sometimes it's right. Every once in a while, it's actually right, but it's almost always wrong. Okay. So we measure the RMR. So this person this person has an RMR of 1,680 calories. They're predicted as 1,481. So she's 13% faster than predicted. So we'll take that 1,680 calories, and that's where we plan her meal plan off of. So 1,680 is somewhere around, give or take some, depending on what they tell us. This is what we're going to put her, her calorie cap at. Okay? If somebody has a lot of fat on them and they have a higher RMR, we'll go below the RMR by some percentage, not too much. And if somebody has a really low RMR, we'll actually go up a little higher because they basically won't be able to eat so little. You know, if somebody has a, an RMR of 900 calories, we're not going to tell somebody to eat 900 calories. They'll starve to death. So um, we'll give them a little more. But it, you, have to have some, you have to have some idea of what people are supposed to eat from a caloric standpoint. People say, oh, you don't have to measure cow, you don't have to track food, just go out, eat, eat liberally, take the holistic approach, you know, shop the perimeter of the grocery store, that, stuff like that. And those are all good suggestions, but none of them directly guarantee that you're going to be in a calorie deficit, okay? which is really the most important thing. Measure body composition. Um, we like DEXA. Um, and, you know, people will say, you know, you don't, and nobody has access to this. You do have access to this. We'll talk about it later. But um, we don't even look at weight, really. We look at body composition. And I'll, I'll show some reasons why here in a second. We look at some client results. But you have to take the time to find somewhere to actually measure body composition. And don't get one of those Omron random number generators that you hold here and shoot the look. You're better off not even doing it. You're better off not doing it than using one of those devices. Okay? They don't work. They're just not accurate. Um, so anyway, we're, the reason we measure body composition like this is because we're, we're really interested in this number, the fat-free mass. Now, when, when, when Joey this morning was talking about protein, all the studies that he mentioned and all the studies that most people mention give a protein prescription based on kilograms of body weight, right? It's some, it's some factor multiplied by body weight. And we don't do that. Um, the way we look at it is, you know, if somebody comes in and has 100 extra pounds of fat on them, am I going to give them 
100 extra grams of protein to support that 100 extra pounds of fat. I'm not going to do that, right? So we give the protein prescription based on the fat-free mass. Right? And we'll talk about what that is here in a second. So, you know, our di my dietitian, our dietitian always gets, gets uh, worked up about when, we, when somebody comes to our lab who says, oh, yeah, I'm working with a dietitian. And she'll say, well, what did that dietitian tell you? Uh, you know, like the food pyramid or that healthy plate. You know, they, they, they basically give information that you can get off the internet, right? Stuff that's not really tailored to that individual person, and it's not really helpful, okay? That's kind of the holistic approach. They say, well, you shouldn't track your food because it's too restrictive. It, it, it's, it starts these, these disordered eating pattern if you start tracking your food, and we find that that's completely the opposite. Um, you know, we have people that will tell us and when I go out to dinner with my family, women will tell us this, I'll, I'll eat fries off my kid's tray, but I won't order my own fries. We're like, why don't you order your own fries? Because fries are bad for you, right? And, and we, have, we have women sit, sit there and, and told us that the past five years, they haven't had a piece of cake on their daughter's birthday because cake is bad for me. I'm not going to eat cake. Right? But if you can get these, if you can tell people, look, you have 1,600 calories to play with. Eat the piece of cake. And then just make up for it someplace else. And when they, when they think that they can do that, when they realize that they, they can track food, it liberates them to say, okay, I can actually eat these things that I like. As, and as long as if I'm in my surplus, it's going to work and I'm going to be, or with, in my um, calorie range, it's going to be okay. So how do we calculate the macros? So, uh, as Joey said, the RDA for protein, I think, is dismally low. It's like 0.8 grams per kilo or something like that. Um, we give a prescription of 1.0 to 1.4 grams um, per pound of fat-free. We got this um, from this Helms article that was published looking at uh, protein needs in resistance training athletes. And we thought, well, we're giving these people resistance training programs. Um, let's give them the same protein prescription, and we're making sure they're in a calorie deficit. That's the important thing, right? Because we want them to lose fat. They have to be in a calorie deficit, but we don't want them to lose their muscle mass. Okay, and that's, people think, well, you can't do that, right? You can't gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. You absolutely can do that. That's what you should be doing, right? So, um, I put this in here because our dietitian likes it. Even distribution um, among meals for a positive nitrogen balance, that can be argued whether or not you need to do that, meal frequency and things like that. But um, this is what we tell people. And, and we kind of tell people to do this just so that there's consistency throughout the day because a lot of people have a, a habit where they won't really eat breakfast, right? And they'll go and just pick on stuff at lunch. And then they'll get home, and then all bets are off, right? Because you're starving by that time, and you're just scarfing down whatever's in front of you. And, you know, a lot of that can be prevented just by eating more consistently throughout the day. So this is what we typically tell people. Um, fat, again, uh, we tell people 20% of your calories from fat. And I know that um, there's a whole lot of, of buzz about no, 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 um, fat's not really as bad as everybody thinks it is. It's not really fat that makes you fat, it's carbs that make you fat. Um, and it's just really difficult to, to hit a calorie target when you're eating a lot of fat. It's hard to do. If you look at these numbers, an avocado has 23 grams of fat. Two tablespoons of peanut butter, 14 grams of fat. One ounce of almonds, that's like 20 almonds or something like that. You know, if you add these things up, and somebody could eat these in a whole, in this in a whole day, pretty easy, right? That's, that's a thousand calories just from fat right there. This is one ounce of avocado. This, two weeks ago, I think they changed the serving size for an avocado from one ounce to three ounces. So a serving of avocado up until two weeks ago used to be one ounce of avocado, one fifth of an av avocado. That's what that is, 50 calories, right? If you go to Chipotle and get guacamole on your burrito, 250 calories, right? There, you're getting a whole guacamole, or a whole avocado, right? So that, that's a lot, right? So this is why I'm saying if you're eating three avocados a day, yeah, it's heart-healthy fat, but you're not going to lose fat that way. Now, the idea behind, I think, eating more fat is 
yeah, if you eat more fat, it's going to displace something else and you're going to eat less of something else. People don't do that, right? You know, they go to Chipotle and get the burrito and they hear, oh, I heard avocado is good for me. Let's throw some of that on there too, right? And that's kind of, that's kind of the message that people get. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, they came out and said, the cholesterol in eggs isn't bad for you, right? That may be true, but what, what, what is the message that the typical American hears? Now I can eat more eggs, right, eat more eggs. So, you know, instead of when they used to eat egg beaters or egg whites, now they're eating whole eggs and they're getting, you know, all the fat in an egg is in the yolk. So again, it's not that it's necessary, the, the food itself is healthy and nutritious, but it's, it's the, the product of, what, of eating that is really what you care about, right? All right. Carbs. These are some other things that people tell us. I don't eat bananas because they have too much sugar. Carrots have too much sugar. This is a new one, right? Somebody told us they don't eat carrots because there's too much sugar in carrots. Sweet potatoes um, and quinoa they like, but they avoid bread and pasta. Um, try to limit carb intake throughout the day. And the thing that I think we hear over and over again is when we have, we have a lot of people who come in who tell us they don't eat carbs throughout the day and they get home and they're just ravenously hungry. And I think, I'm not really sure about this because I haven't looked into this, but I, it's, I, it almost seems like there's some trigger where if carbohydrate stores become low enough, it triggers some hunger signal. I'm convinced of that. I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I, it's my theory, right? And when people eat more carbohydrate throughout the beginning of the day, they're, they're far less hungry at night. So. So how do we calculate um, macros? Like I said, we give 20% we give of calories from fat, right? And I just made this spreadsheet up just to make that. I used to do this by hand, but it's a lot easier. So remember I said we use a protein factor of 1.0 to 1.4 grams of fat-free. This is the person's calorie goal. So this person has an RMR of 2131. So we set their calorie goal at 2200, right around the RMR. And that would have been based on their activity level and things like that. Um, they're 282, 45% fat. So they have 154 gr um, pounds of fat free and 127 pounds of fat. So we try and put these people, remember everybody gets 20% of their calories from fat. We try and get them as close to this 1.4 as possible without the calories from protein being more than the calories from carbs. So for this individual, you know, they're at 49 grams of fat, 217 grams of protein and 223 grams of carbs. This is that percentage um, distribution. 20% fat, 39 protein, 41 carbs. And it, it typically comes out to somewhere between 37 and 39, 36 and 39% of your calories from protein. But again, you can't just say, all right, we're gonna give you 36% of your calories from protein because you don't know what the calorie number is. You have to know what the calorie number is and you have to measure that, right? So if we distribute, the, if we take those, those macros and distribute that out to two meals and three snacks, this is what it comes out to. So, you know, when you give somebody this kind of prescription, you say, okay, you're gonna eat 2,000 calories and you're gonna eat X grams of this, this, and this, the only way they're gonna know whether they're doing that is if they're tracking their food, right? They're not gonna be able to just go out there and wing it and say, well, this looks like it's 40 grams of this, and that people, people have no idea. And um, if you've never actually tracked your food before, try it. It will be the most enlightening experience you've ever done. Just, just start entering your food, and you will say to yourself, I can't believe I eat that much fat. That's what you're gonna say. I can't believe I eat that much fat every day. You know, unless you're one of those people who like eat extra five tablespoons of coconut oil just because Somebody said eat coconut oil. I don't know what the fascination is with coconut oil, but you get the idea. So we use an app called Fat Secret, and a lot of, how, how many people use MyFitnessPal to track food, right? So we like Fat Secret because Fat Secret has a professional option. So for me as the professional, I can send an invitation to our clients, and they accept us as the professional, and every day I get an email in, with a, in tabular format with all our, our clients and what they ate the day before, just the macro numbers. 
And then I can pull that client up and I can run statistics over a certain date range and things like that. And I can see, are they hitting their targets or not? Because when somebody comes to us a month later and says, your program's not working. And I'll say, all right, let's pull up your food logs. And then we pull up their food logs and they track three days. I'm like, how do I know it's not working? I don't know if you ate what I told you to eat, right? And if, if I pull up their food logs and they've tracked every day and everything's perfect and they lost five pounds of muscle, I know I have to fix something, right? Maybe they're not eating enough protein. Maybe the calorie deficit's too big. Right? But if they don't track those things, I'm really just guessing. Right? So I wanted to put this up here. This is, just, this is um, data that I got yesterday. Because remember, um, we said that we're trying to increase the RMR, right? So we are doing a study in premenopausal women looking at diet and resistance training and, or diet and resistance training alone. And we basically gave these individuals this prescription that I just described. So in this group, this is the diet only group. So this group was not doing any resistance training, okay, diet only. So, and I didn't run the statistics on this, I just plotted this. Each one of these lines is an individual, okay, is a person. So, um, the average of these seven observations in month one was 1,409 was their, their resting metabolic rate. After 16 weeks of eating this way, their RMR average is now 1,590. So, five of the seven went up. Their RMR went up. Okay, five of the seven went up, but interestingly enough, the group as a whole lost fat and gained muscle without training, okay? So think about that. If you can lose fat, increase muscle mass, and drive up the RMR with, by doing nothing else but changing the diet, that's pretty good, right? Because now this individual, first of all, their body fat percentage fell. Brad's looking like that's impossible. It didn't happen, right? <laughs> right. So um, I thought the same thing. Right? Why, what, what's driving up the lean mass mainly? What's driving up the lean mass? And I think it's really just a function of the increased protein intake. So, but I don't really know because I don't know if anybody's, anybody's done a study where they prescribe the diet based on the RMR and then prescribe the protein based on the fat-free mass. Okay? I'm not sure about that. I don't know. We told them not to. The question was, were they doing anything on the side? We told them not to change their, their activity in any way. Um, so I'm not sure. So they, they, we, were, they, we gave them the macros. We told them their, their caloric targets. And they tracked that. So that was basically the honor system. And again, I, I haven't looked at the total mass, but their fat mass fell. So if their fat mass fell, they're in a deficit, right? It depends on who they were. So, so if, they fell, if they fell right at the RMR, um, at like the predicted RMR, we would feed them at the RMR. If they were more than 10% less than the predicted RMR, we would feed them 10% more than their RMR. Yeah. So. Um, I haven't, we haven't, like I said, I just got this yesterday, so we, we haven't compared the actual diet, what they were told to eat, um, versus what they actually did eat. So um, we'll find out, we'll see. But the, I, think the most, I think the most important thing here is, if you can increase the RMR just through the diet alone, it get, what does it do? It gives people the liberty to eat more, right? So if you give somebody a bunch of cardio, and you tell them calories you restrict. Which you'll see these things like, go eat an 800 calorie diet. Well, yeah, that's gonna work if you eat 800 calories and do two hours of cardio a day. You're gonna lose weight. But what are you gonna lose? You're gonna lose fat and you're gonna lose muscle. And if you lose muscle, what's gonna happen to the RMR? You're gonna drive down the RMR, right? So if somebody's eating 1,000 calories, and that's at, let's say their, their RMR is 1,000, you're feeding them at the RMR at 1,000, but then you give them a program that's gonna drive the RMR down, what used to be a calorie load that results in a deficit is eventually not going to result in a deficit anymore because the RMR is going to fall below that, right? Then what do you do at that point? You can't tell them to eat less, right? They're already only eating 1,800, so then they stall, right? They say, well, I can't lose any more weight. 
right? Now what do they do? They quit. So I think the goal is if you can drive up the RMR and give people more wiggle room with what they can eat. If somebody can, if somebody can eat 16 or 1700 calories a day and still lose fat, that's, that's pretty much what you want, right? Because that becomes sustainable. It might take longer. They're not gonna get really super quick results, but if it's sustainable, People can, people can eat 1,600 calories and be comfortable doing that. Right? And every once in a while, you go over that, you go over your target. Nobody hits their target um, calorie cap on a daily basis. Right? It's, it's, some days you're a little over, some days you're a little under, right? But you always have that kind of target that kind of levels out over time. So let's look at some people here. This is uh, Lucy. Lucy's uh, 13 weeks on the diet plus resistance training. This is a DEXA scan. She's a remote client. She lives in Texas. So um, she got her baseline DEXA on April 2nd. She was 208 pounds, all right? So this graph here is showing her mass, just her body mass. This graph is showing her fat mass. This graph is showing her lean mass. Now, she was weight training. She was resistance training, full body workouts three days a week. Her body mass, now she goes 13 weeks, right? She goes back to get her DEXA and look what her weight does. She goes from 208 to 218, right? So what do you, what do you, if that's all you were looking at, if all you were looking at was weight, what do you think she would do? She'd quit, right? She wouldn't continue doing this because she gained 10 pounds in 13 weeks. But look what happened to her body fat. She lost five pounds of body fat and gained 15 pounds of muscle, okay? Her lean went up 15 pounds. So now that could be water in the muscle, whatever, but it's, it's a DEXA scan. And you know she went from 41% to 37%. And she's physically smaller. If you look at her, she's smaller. But she's 10 pounds heavier, right? So you know that's a pretty profound change. Now, that, people typically don't gain 15 pounds of muscle in that short period of time. But, I'm, I'm convinced that if you have the right person who's never done any type of resistance training, who's completely sedentary, who's not eating enough protein, he's eating a crappy diet, they can get very, very rapid increases in muscle if, with the right um, environment. And I think that's a lot of people. You know, we do these studies on college-age men and, and, who, and who are active and say, well, how, much, how fast can you gain muscle? And it looks like it's really, really slow, right? Well, it depends on the population. So this guy, you can, here's a DEXA, here's a DEXA. Um, you can see where the, this guy's body fat is. The yellow is moderate fat, the red is high fat, and the green is lean. So this is 19 weeks, same thing, diet, uh, same diet, uh, eating at the RMR. And you can see that this red line here is his muscle and this black line is his fat. So he starts on April 5th. He has, um, he's 18.8, or I'm sorry, he starts on November 20, uh, 2015 at almost 27% fat. He's got 45 pounds of fat on him. So um, 19 weeks later, he loses 15 pounds of fat, but also adds about five pounds of muscle. So the notion that you can't drop fat and increase muscle at the same time, it's just, it may not be common, but it happens all the time if, you, if you're actually measuring the stuff and you know what to do, right? If you, just, if you just calorie restrict and do a bunch of cardio, yes, you're gonna lose fat and you're gonna lose muscle and it's gonna look like, oh, you can't gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. It's just because you're doing it wrong. So, you know, one of the things that's good about the DEXA is that when, when this guy comes in, you can see here between these two points, his muscle mass is going up and his fat's falling. And all is well and good, well, all's good, right? And then he comes in this point and his muscle mass is falling. So that tells, and he's losing a lot of weight fast. So at this point, we make the decision, well, he's probably in too big of a calorie deficit, right? So let's increase his calories. So we increase his calories and then look what happens. The, the muscle mass then rebounds and goes back up. So again, this is the importance, I think, of monitoring body composition as opposed to weight. Because when you do this, and you can maintain, when you can preserve or increase the muscle mass, you preserve the metabolic engine, the thing that's burning calories, right? And that's really, that's really the key. You have to allow people to be able to eat more liberally or everything that you give them is gonna fail. People like to eat, right? It's a tough habit to break. This guy's on a ketogenic diet. Now, he wasn't doing what we told him to do. 
He was just coming in and getting DEXAs, right? 100 days of keto. And he knew how to do it. He was eating like 85% of his calories from fat. So he comes in. Um, when did he come in? Uh, he, he, well, this was a long time. This second point was when he came in uh, before he started the keto. You can see he was, well, I have a summary of it on the next table. But this is his muscle and his fat. And you can see over time it's going up, it's going up. Then here he starts the ketogenic diet. And what happens? He, both his fat and his muscle plummet. Right? So this is a summary of what's going on there. So on day one, he's 251 pounds. He's got 155 pounds of lean, 88 fat, and his RMR is 2406, which is 10% faster than predicted. Then the guy goes on his ketogenic diet. 100 days, he loses 40 pounds. Of that 40 pounds, 30 of it is from fat, 10 of, his, 10 of it is from muscle. But more importantly, his RMR falls by almost three, or a little more than 300 calories a day. Right? So now he can probably get away with this because he still can get away with eating 2,000 calories. But the guy's like 6'2 or something like that, you know, and 211 pounds. That's not a lot of calories, right? I would much rather have to be able to eat 2,400 than 2,000. Okay? So, um, now, I don't know if this happens with everybody who does a ketogenic diet. I don't know. But it happens with this guy. And one of the things, one of the reasons why people promote a ketogenic diet is they say, well, when I do keto, I'm not hungry, right? I'm eating a lot of fat. I'm not hungry. This guy would come in and he'd brag and he'd say, I only eat 1,500 calories a day, but I eat it in one meal, right? So he would, he would have one meal. That's just like, you know, ribeye and butter or something like that. I don't know. So he eats 1,500 calories, and then he's talking about how great keto is. I'm like, yeah, you're eating 1,500, but your RMR is 24. You're in a 900-calorie deficit just from your RMR alone. You know, I don't, I don't think it's the keto that's making you lose weight. It's the 900-calorie deficit that's causing you to lose weight. But he's not hungry. So, you know, maybe it wouldn't be sustainable if he was eating a mixed macro diet because he'd be starving. But if, if, there, if there is really a hunger suppressing effect from, ke from the keto diet, then that's what's doing it. So, um, anyway, I, I, we don't really recommend that in general. All right, so people always say, well, there's nobody really has accessibility to a DEX and, a metab and, and an RMR, a Cosmet or whatever. There's a, there's a bunch of places around the country called DEXAFIT that are popping up. These are all the DEXAFIT locations in the United States. So we work with clients from all over the country. And what we do is we find out, they'll call us and we find out where they live. And I just go online and I find the closest place for them to get a DEXA and a metabolism test. Sometimes they live near one of these places. If not, I'll find a university for them. Very rarely. Only one or two times have I ever found, had somebody contact me where I couldn't find a place for them to get body composition testing and metabolism testing. One was in Alaska, and one was, one was like right here, like in Mississippi, Arkansas, somewhere right around in there. They had to drive like two and a half hours to go find somebody. But other than that, I was always able, I was always able to find somebody. Did my microphone die? So, you know, if, um, if, you, if you think that, that these aren't accessible, it is, it's very accessible. And there's another place on the, on the West Coast called Body Spec. They actually have roaming trucks where there's a DEXA um, and uh, they just drive around to various locations, gyms and stuff like that, and you can call them and book them. But we just have those people send us those results. They go in, they get testing, they send us the results, we get on the phone with them or we Skype with them. Um, we write their program, we send it to them through the Google Drive, and they, every month or whenever they want to do a follow-up, they check in with us, and that's pretty much how it works. So I think that, um, I think it's important to start using body composition to actually measuring this and using this as the metric instead of looking at, at weight. And I think we have to do this industry-wide, right? And we're the people that are going to do that. Um, the government's not going to do it, right? They're still using BMI, for God's sake. So. Um, <laughs> Which, interestingly enough, you know, we have so many clients that come in that are of normal BMI that are like 35 or 40% fat. Normal weight, right? So, 
you know, people always complain about BMI not being accurate for people who have a high muscle mass, and that's true. You're overweight, you know, if, you're, if you have a high muscle mass, but there, it misses people that are of normal weight but are, are um, extremely high body fat, or people who have really low muscle mass, right? So. Um, so the main challenge that we have is understanding weight loss versus body comp. Um, confidence with weight training, a lot of women that we work with, are, they don't want to go on the side of the gym with the rubber floor, right? I'll stay on the carpeted part, but the rubber part over there, I'm not going over there, right? Because everybody's grunting and screaming and whatever. But um, after a while, they get really good at it and they get really confident with it and then it's, it's no problem. Um, hitting the macros, the hardest thing that people have is hitting their protein goal without going over their fat goal. That's hard to do, but um, again, tracking food, people find it to be extremely enlightening and also liberating because they know, yeah, I can have that piece of cake and I can, I can do that and make it fit within my goals. You know, and somebody was, somebody, I was talking on the phone the other day with somebody and I said, she was saying about, even though she's tracking macros, she's still not eating cake. And I said, okay, so I said, what, happened, what would happen if at the end, of the end of the night, you hit your macros perfectly, but in the middle of the day, you had a donut? And at the end of the night, you're hungry, and you eat chicken and rice, right? What put you over your cap, the donut or the chicken and rice? The chicken and rice is what put her over the calorie cap, right? So, you know, it's not the food itself that is the issue. It's whether or not you're over, whether or not you break that macro goal. And, and you know, when people look at it in, in, from that perspective, they, they, they often just change the way they look at food and they tell us, I'll never look at food the same way again um, because of calorie tracking. So, and it's easy to do. People say, I don't have time to calorie track while they're sitting there eating on their phone on Facebook, right? If you're eating, Looking at your phone, you can go to Fat Secret and say, okay, this is what I'm eating, I'll put it in, right? So that's not really a good excuse.